Okie dokie. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you all for joining us. Today is Thursday, October the 28th, 2021. My name is Ashley and I'm here with Kim Christian. And today we are addressing the question, how can I protect my child with special needs? Before we dive in, let's open up with some housekeeping items. Uh, to help minimize audio distractions, your mics are muted. We are taking general questions today, but if you have a specific question about your situation, just give me a call after the program and we can set up a meeting. Uh, please use the Q&A window on the Zoom toolbar to submit your questions. If we don't answer it during the presentation, we have saved time at the end for Q&A. I did receive one question during registration, which we will address at the end. Uh, we should be together for about 30 minutes. We created a PowerPoint for the program, which we are showing on screen along with our webcams. We are also recording this and we'll email you today's video. Please complete the webinar survey and leave us your feedback about our program. The survey will show in your browser when the webinar ends. If anyone has questions about housekeeping, send me a message in the chat window. Okay, now let's introduce today's speaker, attorney Kim Christian. Kim is a dedicated partner at the Russo Law Group. She's been with the firm for over 15 years and has helped hundreds of clients with elder law, special needs, estate, and trust planning across Long Island. She's the lead planning attorney in the Lido office, and she also uh, meets with clients in the Garden City location. Kim's a member of several professional organizations, including the New York and New Jersey State Bar, NALA, and the Academy of Special Needs Planners. She was also recognized as a super lawyer rising star. So Kim, thanks for being here. We are now going to turn off our webcams and turn our attentions to the slide. And to you, Kim, the floor is all yours. Hello, everyone. I'm happy to be here. Thank you for joining us today. Um, Ashley, thank you for the wonderful introduction. I appreciate that. So we have a robust um, a program for you today, what we will cover, parents, estate plan. I'm gonna focus on the third party supplemental needs trust today. Second part is gonna be maximizing government benefits. And the third part is gonna be planning for the adult child. So let's dive right in. The parents estate plan. I thought we'd focus on one of the key documents that many of the parents' estate plan should have. It's called a third-party supplemental needs trust. It's a vehicle where the parent provides assets and income to supplement his or her child's needs. It protects assets from the government. It allows government benefits to be maintained by the child, and it is intertwined with SSI, Supplemental Security Income, and Medicaid. So let's dive into it a little bit. The Supplemental Needs Trust. Well, first off, it's something called a third-party trust, right? So I'm just gonna read over these um, points, third-party trust with the arrow of revocable or irrevocable, living or testamentary, and funded with assets such as the house, liquid, life insurance, retirement income. Now I'm gonna go back up to the chain and I'm gonna walk you through each prong and why they're important. So an overarching way to explain the third party trust is to use the word third party. A first party would be your child with the special needs. The second party would be the trustee. And the third party would be you, the person whose assets are going into the trust. So when you hear third party, you think, okay, these are not the assets of my child, they're my assets. Whether it be assets I wanna leave to my child through inheritance, or whether it be assets that I wanna give during their lifetime, but I know that I can't give them outright to them, so I want to put them in a trust. So you are the third party, and that's why it's called a third party trust. In your mind, it's assets other than those owned by your child. Then you go to the next prong and you ask yourself, well, do I think it should be revocable or irrevocable? And does it have to be one or the other? And it really depends on your situation. 
So many times our clients will do a revocable third party supplemental needs trust because they're in control of it during their lifetime. And then ultimately when they're no longer here, it becomes irrevocable and protects the child at that point. You can also do an irrevocable third party special needs trust, and that would have to do with perhaps protecting your assets during your lifetime, which would ultimately trickle down and be protected for your child. Then, of course, there's something called living or testamentary. A living trust is a trust that you would set up during your lifetime. So if I was setting up a trust for my son and I wanted to do a living trust, I would do a trust during my lifetime, I'd set it up and I'd have the ability to fund it during my lifetime. Some people say, well, I don't need to do that. There's nothing I'm gonna put in the trust for my child during my lifetime. It's really my child's inheritance that I'm concerned about. I don't wanna leave it outright to them and perhaps disrupt benefits or prevent them from getting benefits. I wanna provide in my testamentary plan, whether it be a will or whether it be a trust, that way in the future when I'm no longer here, it passes to my child in a third party supplemental needs trust. So the distinction between living and testamentary are do I fund it now while I'm alive or if it's just an inheritance that I'm concerned about, then perhaps I fund and create the trust upon my passing. And that is done so through your documents such as your last will and testament or your living trust. Lastly, you determine, well, what assets are gonna fund these trusts? If this third party supplemental needs trust is meant to preserve my child's assets for their quality of life, so it's not going to supplant their government benefits. For example, if they're receiving SSI or Medicaid, we don't want it to um, disrupt those benefits. It's there for things um, to enhance their quality of life. So what assets are gonna be funded with it? Many times a person will leave their house in a trust for their child, perhaps a bank account or a brokerage account. Life insurance is a very common asset vehicle used um, to fund the trust for their child's lifetime. And there in certain instances, you can do a trust to protect the retirement income such as an IRA as well. Um, there's very specific rules with that, of course, because it is a qualified account, but it can be done. So when it comes to planning for the parents, you wanna do your overall estate planning. Of course, today we specifically focused on the third party supplemental needs trust, because I think if you were going to go into what the must have documents or the common documents in a parent's estate plan, that would be an important one. You never want to have a plan without a way of protecting your child, specifically if you have assets that are going to be left for them after your passing. There's where the third party supplemental needs trust comes in. And as I mentioned earlier, you can do it during your lifetime or you could do it upon your passing. It really depends upon the facts and circumstances that would warrant which one you pick. Now, I put advanced directives here, not because I wanna take away from the importance of the third party supplemental needs trust, but I do feel that in any estate plan, you should have your advanced directives. Those are your powers of attorney for financial decision-making, your healthcare proxy for healthcare decision-making, and your living will for end-of-life instructions. Advanced directives are important because it legally nominates a person to assist you in the event you can't help yourself, whether it be for finances or whether it be for health care. And I think it pertains to planning for your child with special needs because one of the best ways to help them is to help yourself. So just make sure that in the event you decline in any way, there is someone there that can legally assist you with all of your decisions, including your estate plan. All right, let's move on to category two, maximizing government benefits. So government benefits for your child, when it comes to money, there's supplemental security income, often known as SSI. And when it comes to medical coverage, there's private insurance and there's Medicaid. 
So SSI and Medicaid for your child. Well, first of all, SSI, Supplemental Security Income, is a means-tested program that provides cash payments to disabled children, disabled adults, and individuals age 65 or older. And there's a financially means-tested program, which means they're allowed limited assets and income, right? So what the SS rules, SSI rules say is, if I have too much money, specifically more than $2,000, well, then I am not eligible for SSI. And what's interesting is, is before age 18, there's something called parental deeming. And what parental deeming is, is the deeming of the parent's assets and income, and they're imputed to the child. And therefore, many times, even though the child may be under the income and asset limit, because of deeming, they're over and they have to wait till after age 18 for the deeming to stop. And then it makes sense that they're now eligible. Now, if you do get SSI at 18, then after a period of years at age 21, you are automatically eligible for Medicaid. And that is important. It's important for different reasons. As you, we saw on the slide before, when it comes to medical coverage, yes, there is private insurance, but oftentimes we use the Medicaid component to cover um, the medical piece of this. Okay, so I'm actually, Ashley, just gonna go back to the slide before, I apologize. I just wanted to say a couple of more things. And what's important about the SSI and Medicaid is just making sure that we prepare in advance and that we um, make sure that the child has no assets that are going to eliminate their eligibility at age 18. So I always give the bond or the shoebox example. And the shoebox example is, is when my child was born, everyone was so excited and so kind and they issued bonds for my child. Um, as a gift. And I put them in a shoebox. And, you know, I realized, oh my goodness, she's going to turn age 18. Deeming is going to stop. But I didn't realize I still had all these bonds. And perhaps she's over the $2,000 limit. So what you want to be doing in advance is just thinking about things. What if anything did the child accumulate? Because there is a three year look back when it comes to SSI. So you can't necessarily just dispose of those bonds. Um, so you just wanna be talking about it and planning for it in advance. All right, next slide. Thanks, Ashley. All right, so another really important component of this is where is my child going to live? So uh, many of my clients, have their child living with them. So as part of your estate planning, you just want to be thinking, well, if they're not able to live with me anymore, for many reasons, including my passing, where are they going to live? So some of the options include living independently or living independently with supportive services, perhaps living with a family member or living in a group home. And if you live independently, or you live independently with supportive services, or you live with a family member or in a group residence, often there are programs that Medicaid will cover some of the services, uh, some of the fees that are associated with living there. And SSI will also help as far as um, what is used to fund these different living arrangements. So again, it's really important that we focus on making sure my child is ultimately eligible um, for certain means-tested programs such as SSI and Medicaid because it opens the door to different um, supportive living services or group homes that would be covered, otherwise covered by Medicaid. All right, so we're going to head into um, planning for the adult child. So we talked about planning for the parent. We talked about making sure we maximize benefits and really thinking ahead, um, not only to what benefits they might need, but also how and where are they going to live. And then what we want to round out this program with is, is the adult child's planning. So 
the first prong that I have here is decision making and guardianship. And the second prong that I have here is the first party special needs trust. And I'm sure you could see where this is headed considering we spoke about the third party. So let's start with decision making. Well, in New York, if your child is under the age of 18, well, then you still have the right as a parent to make financial and healthcare decisions for them. But even though there will always be your baby at age 18, your parent does lose the right to make decisions. So when your child reaches 18 in New York, you no longer have that legal right to make decisions for them. So in the case where you can't, a legal guardian would need to be appointed by the court unless they could sign a power of attorney, a healthcare proxy, and a living will. And if your child has capacity and is 18 or older. So what do I mean by that? So a lot of times I will have um, clients come in and say, oh, we definitely need a guardianship. My child is about to turn 18. Um, I, I have to make sure that I'm still able to make health care and financial decisions for them. And naturally, I do understand the urgency, but we have a conversation. And the conversation is, tell me about your child. And we talk about the child. And during that conversation, we make a decision. Can he or she actually sign what's called a power of attorney, a health care proxy, and a living will? A power of attorney is the document that the child can sign that says, I consent to my mom or my dad or whomever they consent to acting on behalf so they can make any and all financial decisions for me. They can also do a healthcare proxy. A healthcare proxy is a document that says that they are consenting to an order at which who can make those decisions for them. So for example, my son might say, I'd like my mom to make my healthcare decisions. And if she can't do it, then I'd like my dad to. And then if she can't do it or he can't do it, I'd like my brother. So you are, if they have capacity, have the ability to put in writing um, what they're, who they appoint for financial and healthcare decisions. Um, that would avoid actually the need for court involvement and the need for a guardianship. Of course, there are always situations where the child does not have the capacity to sign these documents, and we do need to seek guardianship. So guardianship, the guardianship court in general is very friendly, right? They're looking, especially in a situation like this, to make sure that the child with special needs is protected, to make sure that they have the right individual who's going to make those decisions for them. And what you wanna be thinking about when you uh, petition for guardianship is, is you wanna get legal guardianship over the person and the property. And that's really important because you wanna make sure you have that ability to make personal decisions for the person and you have the ability to make financial decisions for the person. So that's why they make a distinction between guardian of the person and guardian of the property the person being personal things and the property um, being money and finances. And by personal things, it's also healthcare decisions. So the guardianship court in general is very friendly. You wanna have a guardian be appointed for the person and the property. And because we're talking about planning in advance, you really wanna be thinking of what we call standby guardians. Standby guardians are guardians that say, in the event I am unable to be the guardian, who would my backup be? Who would be the most appropriate person or persons to be my child's backup guardian? Sometimes it's other siblings, things of that nature. But you want to see if you can get that in place. That way it avoids the concern that if something were to happen to you, there's no one to take care of your child. And of course, there's responsibilities that go along with being the legal guardian. 
not only do you have the responsibility of taking care of the child from a legal capacity standpoint, but you have to make sure that you're managing the finances correctly. Um, you're keeping up with the court uh, requirements such as filing accountings and things like that. And it's all there to safeguard the child and make sure that everything is being done in their best interest. So what if your child has assets? So I kind of touched on this before. I talked about the shoebox example, the example of, hey, I put all these savings bonds in a shoebox, and now I realize we need to apply for SSI. They're turning 18, and my child has assets in their name. Or Uncle, you know, Stephen decided to leave as of the goodness of his heart $50,000 to my child in his will, but unfortunately he didn't leave it in a trust. He had the best of intentions, but he left it outright. So now I have, you know, $50,000 that I need to make sure that I account for in order to be eligible for SSI, for example. As I mentioned earlier, you can't have more than $2,000 in your child's name for them to qualify for SSI. So what is one of the things you can do? One of the things you can do is you can set up a first party special needs trust. And first party, if you recall, means assets of the child who's looking for SSI and or Medicaid. So the first party would be your child. And if they're the first party, it's their assets that we're looking to protect. So you set up a special needs trust. Um, and again, it's for the benefit of your child. You transfer those assets in. And because it's a first party trust, it's actually an exempt transfer. So they can legitimately take those assets they can fund the trust and they can be eligible for Medicaid because it's a first party, at Medicaid and SSI, because it's a first party trust. It protects the assets and the income of the person who's disabled while accessing government benefits. So the special needs trust with your child, as I mentioned, is funded with the assets of the person who's disabled and there is a requirement that they be under the age of 65. Now, the reason it's considered exempt, unlike the third party trust, is because there is a payback provision to New York State for Medicaid. So if I put that $50,000 in the trust and I use it all for the benefit of my child and there's nothing left in the trust when my child is no longer with us, then there's no payback. But let's say I had a settlement and it, we put it in the trust, right? My child had a settlement, we put it in the trust. It was substantial and there was money left in the trust. Well, in order to get that exemption, that no penalty for the transfer to remain on SSI or be on SSI, then there is a requirement that Medicaid get paid back. You pay back to New York State for Medicaid. So that's important. When you're sitting with your planner, you want to make sure that you're um, understanding which trust is appropriate and why, and what are the ultimate consequences of the trust as far as payback or no payback. Now, unlike the third party trust, where I said it could be revocable or irrevocable, this particular trust needs to be irrevocable. And it needs to be irrevocable because we need to create that barrier so we can say, my child does not have more than $2,000 in their name. It's irrevocable and therefore they do not have the control that would eliminate their ability to get the benefits. Last but not least, I always speak briefly about selecting a trustee because I do feel that it's important. The trustee is going to be the individual who is going to manage the trust and ultimately be making decisions about distributions from the trust. So there are several important decisions in the world of planning, but this is very important. So some of the options include a family member, friends, professionals, sometimes people hire corporate bank or trust companies, and sometimes they even set up pooled trusts. But again, when you're speaking to your planner, I recommend that you spend time talking about who the trustee is going to be, because that is the person that is going to be uh, to provide or to manage the trust and make the distributions to your child.
or for the benefit of your child. So one of the slides I put in here is the pool trust for your child. It's all alternative to the first party special needs trust. And instead of a payback to the state for Medicaid, you, there's a payback, the remainder goes to a charity. So if you have charitable intentions, perhaps you set up what's called a pool trust. A pool trust is a separate entity that's set up. There are many, many pool trusts out there. Um, they're all driven state by sp state. Some of the common ones or one of the ones that's most near and dear to our heart is something called the Teresa Foundation. The Teresa Foundation is a trust for children with special needs. It focuses on music, dance, art, theater, all for those children. And what the pool trust allows you to do is what's similar to what I talked about the first party uh, special needs trust. You could take the assets or income that's in your child's name and you can fund the pool trust and that will create either immediate eligibility or if it's a settlement or something of that nature where a child's coming into money, it will maintain any benefits that they might be on. So there's the first party special needs trust or there's the pool trust, which is an alternative to the special needs trust, but each one of those has that first party component to it. All right, so what should you do now? I spoke about, you know, I tried to narrow the scope down, talk about what I would consider probably must have things. So if you were to say to me, Kim, well, what should I do now? Um, you wanna just create a plan. And the best way to do it is really to talk about it. Talk through um, what your goals are. We'll identify whether a living trust is appropriate, um, whether a testamentary trust is appropriate, whether an irrevocable trust is appropriate or a revocable trust. I mean, there's so many different things we'll walk through, but by the end of it, you will have created a plan and have some peace of mind, particularly so that you know that your child is taken care of. You just wanna make sure your legal documents are comprehensive and up to date. I call it the checkup, right? Bring in your documents for a checkup and make sure they actually say what you think they say and they actually do what you think they do. Because sometimes I know even in my own experience in my own life, right? We think we have something the way we thought we wanted it to be. And then lo and behold, it, many years have passed and perhaps something has changed and it needs updating. And then last but not least, right? Get your plan implemented. Um, you know, we can think and think about doing things, but really and truly, if you can get it implemented, it will give you the peace of mind. All right, so let's move to questions. Um, I know, Ashley, you had mentioned that someone actually had a question that they submitted in advance, which I think is awesome. So let me take that one first. Sure. This was sent in by uh, Steve, uh, last name's Mandel. How do you arrange for lifetime income stream, which the child has no power over? Right. That's an excellent question. And that speaks to establishing a trust. So if you were going to provide the income for your child for their lifetime, and it was going to be an asset um, of yours that was going to create that income, then within the terms of the trust, you would speak to your planner and you'd say, I'd like the following benchmarks where my child gets distributions from the trust. And there's different ways to do it. But one of the ways, because you raised this, in your question is to provide an income stream. Now, of course, we talk about it because income, mandatory income to your child, you know, may have an effect on their benefits, right? So if you're creating something where they're getting income every month or every year, whatever the case is, then that may offset their SSI. So there may be situations where we don't want to mandate income and we want to leave it in a discretionary fashion. Same with Medicaid, right? But if that, after we've discussed it and worked it out, is really and truly what your goal is to provide a lifetime income stream, then you would be able to do it through a trust. Okay, Ashley, do we have another question? We do. We have a couple that just came through on the on the Zoom Q and A. All right, uh, Christine and uh, Jody. Okay. 
Oh, <laughs> we're getting no oh, feedback. Oh, right. All that. right. Great. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So can someone else fund my child's trust through their insurance or is it just me? Yeah, I think that's an awesome question. Um, and I talk about it a lot. And many reasons people will do a third party trust is because they want to be able to let others add money to it. So the third party, as long as it's not a first party like your child, it could be a third party other than you. So for example, a grandparent, right? They might say, hey, I want to leave something to my, my grandson. And I say to them, well, please don't do that if you're going to do it outright. I really appreciate your intention, but it can end up harming them. Perhaps in your documents, have it made payable to their special needs, uh, supplemental needs trust. So the answer to your question is sure, through life insurance, a third party, and it doesn't necessarily have to be you, it could be their grandparents, it could be siblings, it could be you know someone who cares for them, can name the third party trust as the beneficiary of the life insurance. Of course, always look before you leap, make sure your particular trust has the ability to accept funds from additional sources, but in general, um, the answer is yes. All right. So um, if an adult, if an adult has Medicare, what changes? Well, that's interesting. So what changes? One of the things that changes is, is do I actually need Medicaid then? And you can have Medicare and Medicaid at the same time. They can run parallel to one another. Um, but if Medicare is covering their needs as far as healthcare, then one of the things that would change perhaps is that they don't need to access the Medicaid system. Um, but if they do need, let's say, um, personal care assistance or things that Medicare would not cover, then you might have both at the same time. And what changes as far as your planning? Perhaps nothing. You might still wanna have your trust for your child, because even if they're receiving Medicare and may not necessarily need a means tested program, they might still need someone to help manage their funds for them. So I think really um, there's nuances that change, but I think the overall plan to protect your child um, doesn't really change. Okay. So I've got two more I think I can get. Oh, and I think they're from the same person. So they'll, I'll tie them in together. Um, uh, my son is one of six children. Wow, that's awesome. We have done nothing else for planning for him and them. What is your advice? So my advice is meet with, you know, an estate planning attorney as soon as possible. And, you know, when you speak to your estate planning attorney, you're going to address all of your children. And you're going to speak about what your intention is for all of them. And then what will happen is, is you'll build in a plan that accounts for, you know, um, what you want to do for each and every one of them. Every child is different. So you may have a plan for each child and you can incorporate that into all of your documents. So my advice to you is, is to meet with an estate planner um, and talk it out so you can get something in place as soon as possible. All right. Additionally, your opinion on the ABLE account is a place to save money for a child. He's 23. Yeah, I think an ABLE account is a really good um, planning tool that you can use. It's, it's an alternative um, or it can also run together with the supplemental or the special needs trust. Um, and it's kind of like um, I would liken it to a 529 account. Right, so it's able to grow tax-free um, and used for specific things. So I do like it as a planning vehicle. You just want to address it with your planner just to make sure it's the right fit um, within the plan. Okay, last but not least, um, I'm going to take one more. My child is about to receive a large sum of money from a case that is resolving in court. How can I protect his funds, maintain his Medicaid and SSI benefits? I'd like to open a bank account, an ABLE account. All right. So Marisol, there is a lot to this. Um, and, you know, we deal with this a lot because many times, um, our families have a child who is about to resolve a settlement in court. 
And for me to uh, give a plan on a general seminar um, would not be appropriate, but I would say this, you want to make sure that there is a planning vehicle in place, an appropriate one um, to capture these funds and to make sure either and I see here they already have Medicaid and SSI, so maintain their SSI benefits. So my recommendation is, is that you speak to a planning attorney um, and you discuss all your options because depending on the sum of the money, different trusts may make different sense. Okay? Okay. All right, so I think um, I'm going to have Ashley wrap it up. It was an absolute pleasure being able to um, address all of you today. Please um, have a, a wonderful end of uh, October and uh, a good rest of the fall. And um, hopefully if you have any questions or you'd like to meet with us, you know that we're here to be a resource for you. Sure. Great. Thank you, Kim. And thank you for all your questions. Uh, let me just swoop on in here. We'll wrap it up. Uh, what makes Russo Law Group different? Uh, we can use our experience and knowledge to provide solutions to your problems, or better yet, hope you avoid problems in the future, but we truly care about our clients. We have over 35 years of estate planning experience. We've served over 18,000 families across Long Island in three convenient locations, Garden City, Lido Beach, and Islandia. We will make home visits if necessary and arrange for out of office document signings. We're also available for virtual meetings uh, and consultations. We are very strong with handling crisis situations and have a robust trust and estate administration department. So please put our experience to the test. Feel free to give me a call if anyone has questions about our services or if you would like to speak with an attorney about your estate plan. Uh, speaking of, for everyone joining us live today, I'm excited to offer all of you an exclusive discount of 25% off your estate planning meeting. It's a value of 150 bucks. Uh, during this meeting, you'll sit down with an experienced estate and special needs planning attorney like Kim. The attorney will review your existing legal documents, your personal and financial information, uh, and after understanding your objectives and situation, they'll develop an action plan uh, that's tailored to meet to meet your needs. So please don't wait. Uh, you must schedule this meeting before November 12th to receive the discount. Um, and also a quick teaser, we are lining up a follow-up webinar from this one, but next time we'll be discussing uh, protecting your child with special needs who is a minor. Uh, and also, Vincent Russo is preparing a presentation on the new tax laws, so keep an eye out for that. Uh, Kim, that's going to wrap it up. Any any final words of, of wisdom? <laughs> uh, just be safe and be well, and I look forward to seeing you all again. Have all a right. great day. All right. Thank you. You too, and a happy Halloween, guys. Have a good one. Bye. Bye.